Hello. Hi. It's, uh, it's very nice to be here. It's um, also nice to see that people actually came. That's always a lovely thing. And I'm sorry I'm late. I'm sorry that I kept you waiting, but I thought I would be an authentic Nigerian for once. <laughs> so when I was 10 years old, I developed a love for stamp collecting. I was in grade five in the university primary school in Soka, the university town where I grew up in Nigeria. I don't remember where this interest in stamps came from, but I remember carefully combing through the dusty piles of envelopes in my father's study, my heart full of hopeful anticipation. I would sneeze from the dust. I would explore old forgotten drawers. There were stamps from the US and from the UK, many of them disappointingly similar, yet another American flag. Yet another profile of the queen. But then, from time to time, something magical happened. I would find an unusual stamp. I still remember very clearly the feeling of discovering a precious, intact, brightly colored stamp from Hungary. I was full of joyful accomplishment. So carefully, lovingly, I unpeeled it from the envelope placed it in my small stamp album, and on my tongue, I tasted triumph. Then, one day, the boy I liked, a lovely and attentive boy, whose family was more cosmopolitan than mine, whose mother was not Nigerian, and who had widely traveled relatives, gave me a present, a large album filled with stamps, his stamp collection hundreds of stamps from far-flung lands. At first, I was excited, and then I felt deflated. My interest in stamps ended that day. I don't remember what I did with the stamp album. All I remember is feeling as though I had been cheated of something, because suddenly I had all of these stamps, but there were too many, and it had been too easy. I've often thought about this story and wondered what lesson I could draw from it. What did it mean? Why was I deflated by what was obviously a kind gift? There were so many stamps in that album, page after page of global relics. And even though they were mine, it did not truly really feel like mine. Perhaps because the hobby of stamp collecting is not merely about having stamps, but also about the process of collecting itself. The searching, the negotiating, the effort. And in some ways, this parallels the world we live in today. There seems to be so much to consume, too much to consume, that sometimes I do not want to consume anything at all. There are interesting episodes of radio programs every day. There seems to be a new podcast every day, new articles from a thousand different sources, wonderful new books calling to be read, new episodes of news programs, the latest good show on Netflix and Hulu and HBO, and the newest, coolest site for online shopping. It is dizzying, even more dizzying by how fast it all is, how seamlessly I download books on my Kindle, how quickly articles line up on my reading tab. And then there is social media. Even for someone like myself, who is not active in social media, who does not tweet, it is clear that the ethos of social media has pervaded our existence today. And it is an ethos that speaks to everything that is easy, fast, and often ill-considered. Some years ago, I was doing a fellowship at a US college, and somebody who was a grad student at the college, and who must have found my college email address in the database, sent me an email. This person said he had read my work and asked that we meet for coffee and even gave me options for different coffee shops. The tone was extremely personal, as though I already knew this person. I was startled by how presumptuous the email was. I talked about it with my brother Kenneth, who is here by the way, and who is the coolest little brother in the world. <laughs> And even though he's more than six feet tall, he's still my little brother. Anyway, so I told Kenneth about it, and he said quite simply to me as a way of explanation, 
it's because you're not on social media. If you were active on social media, that email would feel normal. People are like that on social media. I thought that the email lacked courtesy and respect mm -hmm. because it assumed an intimacy that was wholly unearned. It was a product of the ethos of social media. So what does it mean that a tool that presumably connects us also causes us to disregard so many ordinary social courtesies? Of course, there are the more brutal examples of people being harassed and attacked on social media, of people using language on social media that they would never use ordinarily. But so in thinking about the theme of, this, of today's evening, how can we deal with what our present time requires? What will the generations ahead of us, that is, assuming that the human race survives, make of us? What will they remember of us? I believe that our greatest human need is to be seen. And I mean seen in a broad sense. We want to be acknowledged. We want to be loved. We want dignity. We want to be allowed to have our flaws and we want to strive to improve. But we seem to be increasingly blinded. I'm stunned by how quick we are to dish out condemnation. And by we, I mean the sort of people who are here, you and I, people who come for things like the night of ideas, like the French Embassy. <laughs> we are now a generation of people who are quick to pontificate about what is wrong, and yet we're not as exercised in knowing what is true. Sanctimony has become currency. Outrage is very easy. There are valid and worrying concerns that face our future as humans. Inequality, racial, gender, economic, climate change, the place of artificial intelligence. But I find myself most worried about the possible death of critical thinking, and consequently the death of empathy because both are central to how we understand and deal with all of the other challenges that we face. It might seem odd to connect critical thinking and empathy, but the two are connected. If we're able to think critically, then we are more able to exercise empathy. Many Western societies have long held that emotion and rationality are mutually exclusive, and this was also often gendered. Men were said to be rational, women were said to be emotional, but we now know that both are intertwined and that, in fact, humans make their decisions based on emotion. So critical thinking, for me, is simply the ability to think clearly, to hold ideas in your mind, to weigh them, to dissect them. And if we are able to do this, then we are able to truly see other human beings. The writer Colin McCann says that to read a book is to be alive in a body that is not your own. That, for me, is the best, best example of that link between critical thinking and empathy. To read, to be alive in a body that is not your own. To hear another person's story. To truly, to truly see another person. Why does this matter? Because empathy and critical thinking as starting points would radically change the way we deal with everything. I recently read an American public official talking about South and Central American parents who were sending their children to the US border and hoping they would be able to cross over. And this American public official said, well, if you don't want your children to be treated badly, then don't send them to cross the US border illegally because that is irresponsible parenting. Now, this kind of response demonstrates a lack of empathy a lack of emotional intelligence, an inability to imagine what, another's person, what another person's story might be. Because this American would know otherwise, that the parents sending their children to the border are far from irresponsible, that theirs is in fact a heart-wrenching act of love, born of that desire to want more and to want better for your offspring. I have always wanted, fiercely and uncompromisingly, to live a life of the mind, a life of the imagination. And I do, and I'm grateful that I can. And yet I wonder how much of this desire has been flattened by living in the age that we do. My attention span is shorter than it used to be. 
As a child, I was very easily absorbed in books. But now I struggle to be fully absorbed because I'm reading four or five books at the same time. And this, of course, might be a result of a collective lowering of our attention spans, or might simply be that I'm getting older. It's very easy to blame social media for everything. And of course, social media is not inherently bad, but it is worth asking whether it is possible, for example, to consume social media in sips rather than in gulps. My niece recently was at my house, and because I like to be a green auntie when I buy get the opportunity, I, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> that's good to know, I turned off the Wi-Fi without telling her. Um, and so she said, Auntie, the Wi-Fi isn't working. And I'm like, I don't know why. <laughs> but, but I had turned it off. And so I said to her, well, now you're, you, you can't do Instagram. Why don't you read a book? And my thing was, get off Instagram for an hour. Read, and read. Read for just one hour. And read something that is continuous. So tweets don't count. Read an article, read a book, and afterwards think. If there's anything outrageous on social media, when I do turn on the Wi-Fi and you get back on, look at the primary source first before you decide whether or not to be outraged. And never form an opinion without context. Now, I, I, I wish I could tell you that this worked, but my, um, it didn't. Um, my niece just sort of you know, hung around until I turned it back on. But speaking of my niece, we were once having another conversation. And I said to her that I wished everyone would just slow down a little. And she said, that's a very privileged position to have, that people who have two jobs, you know, they can't afford to slow down. And I said, actually, my feeling about people being able to slow down is not about the privilege, it's about a human right. Those people with two jobs would rather have one job with benefits and vacation time and the kind of health insurance that doesn't make you terrified of becoming ill. So what if big corporations included childcare centers in the same practical manner with which they include parking lots and cafeterias in their premises? What if, in short, we remake capitalism? What if we remake the way the world is? What if we stopped using growth as a measuring tool and instead used human well-being, knowing that we are still measuring growth, but in a more holistic way? Some people might say that there is a certain kind of radical thinking that will never walk in today's world. But our progress as human beings has been propelled by radical thinking. Until Galileo lifted his telescope to the sky, the best European universities were teaching their students that the heavens were perfectly geocentric and that the earth was the center of it all. Galileo was castigated. But he was right, and what he said was true, and it ended up changing the course of human understanding of the natural world and the place of humans in it. Knowledge is continually revised, and this should be our basis for empathy. We don't know it all. The writer and thinker Rebecca West was once asked this question in an interview. Have you ever been tempted at all to any kind of religious belief? And she responded, oh yes, it all seems so damn silly and incomprehensible. There might as well be a silly and incomprehensible solution, don't you think? Now I say this, of course, with great respect for religion, but I think that Miss West, Miss West in her brilliance and her humor and her ability to tell the truth of the human condition, which is this, that there is much we do not know. There is much we cannot explain, and this is the reason for empathy. It's the reason for kindness. It's the reason for considering the other person's story. Thank you.